So, uh, welcome to uh, today's lecture. Uh, this will be the first uh, of the two lectures in the fourth and final theme. Uh, we'll focus on software testing. Today we will be at the more generic level so that you guys uh, will uh, uh, get a better understanding for, for what this is all about in a, in a large project. Uh, I assume that uh, when, when you hear the word testing here, you, you, uh, each and every one of you will have his or her own understanding of that and what it means. And hopefully after today there will be a more uniform view on, on what software testing can be. So, uh, software testing. Well, systems and software engineering, the, the uh, topic for this class, uh, well, what we've seen in, in, in uh, recent years is that as we start to uh, use software together with systems, uh, by that system I mean hardware systems, uh, controlling cars, controlling power plants, uh, aircrafts, etc. Well, uh, testing is not necessarily just about uh, getting the functionality, it's much more to it. And uh, just to uh, give you some, some first impression here, uh, these are some, some, some fairly old numbers, but it's just to give you some understanding of, of the, the, well, the, the money in this uh, uh, business and, and how much money uh, that are lost because of, of um, well, defect software. Uh, so, these are rough estimates, but, but uh, if you go and check the Swedish numbers uh, at, at the, the final one here, it's, it's what, what people talk about the, in terms of, well, lost production, uh, uh, well, work hours, uh, things like that. It's, it's not pocket money we're talking about. It's a lot of money. So, so uh, Software failures, when software fails to deliver the expected functionality with the expected quality to, to its end users, is extremely costly. And there's more to it because, well, this is money. Money's, well, one thing. But uh, here are two other examples. Uh, or two, uh, two concrete examples. And what I haven't listed are the examples where we actually have fatal re results due to uh, uh, failures in software. There's been quite recently, well, when you have cars uh, uh, the, the cruise control, for instance, uh, uh, if you have a faulty cruise control, that can have a very uh, severe uh, consequence. And, and uh, what we can say here is, is that when it comes to software, uh, or any complex system, I should say, it's it's often the, the, the very small problems that have these dramatic consequences. People are always surprised. Oh, can this little mistake here actually result in that? So there was an example uh, 15 years ago or something like that. It was uh, the, the European Space Agency. They, they uh, launched a, 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 a rocket with some very expensive satell satellites on board. And, and after some time, the, the, it was like seconds, the, the, the rocket uh, uh, self-destroyed. And, and the reason why was that, that someone forgot to link in the right version of a library. 
Okay, so very small mistake. Uh, so how can we, well, get around this? Well, here's one example. It's a little bit more recent, and 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 down here we have a, a, a security glitch. So so, okay, iOS has been updated since yes, but. An attacker with a privileged network position may capture or modify data in sessions protected by these security protocols. So, the analysis of this, well, it was in this little piece of code and it was this part here. The fact that you have two godos here, and this is, this is from the analysis, the code will always jump to the end from the second go to. Uh, error will contain a successful value, blah, 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 verification will never fail. Aha, okay. So, and this, well, you guys, you, you, uh, if you looked at the, the errors made by us when we deployed the first assignment here, there was uh, one little uh, uh, mistake in Git when we, we uh, pushed to Git, that costed some of you hours, days. Here's a very small one that, that caused a security glitch in, in, in one of the world's most popular, popular operating systems. So what you can see here is, is that when it comes to testing, the devil is definitely in the details. And how can you make sure that you will find these small, small, small mistakes in a huge project involving not necessarily just one software system, many software systems interacting with hardware, machinery, different equipment. How can you do that? Well, first we, we have to, to, to figure out what we what we mean by this. And, and well, if you look at testing as a definition, I would say that most of you guys would think of testing as running a program. You agree to that? Running a program, yes. All, everyone is nodding here in the room, okay. Uh, trying to find faults, okay. Faults. We have something called defects, we have errors, we have flaws, we have faults, we have bugs. What is it? What's that? Are they any different? Or is it the same word or different words for the same thing? Well, several people have spent, well, uh, time trying to, to come up with a, a, a terminology here. And I, I will just give you this terminology here because it's, 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 it's important to, to make a distinction between a fault, an error, and a failure. Because you can make faults, for instance, in your code. When you code, you can introduce a fault. Okay. And this fault may have a consequence that the program, when you execute it, enters an erroneous state, okay? That's an error. So a fault may cause an error. However, we have the third one here. A failure must be observable from the outside. And this means that, well, just because we have a fault that results in an error, there is no connection that always turn an error into a failure. So, what are the consequences of this for us as testers? Because as a tester, 
you guys, you want to remove the faults, okay? The mistakes made. You want to correct the mistakes made when someone coded, okay? So, so what can you do? You want to run the program? We agreed on that. Okay, so you run the program. You want to generate failures, yes? Because if you generate a failure, you can observe and you can say, hey, we have a failure. There must be a fault somewhere. Okay? But the problem here is the little guy in the middle. There must, may still be errors that you can never observe from running the application. You see? So, so this is why, well, what most people uh, think is testing, more or less like using the application, is not sufficient. You have to think about it in a different way. It's a much more complex problem than that. Because what we want to do, what we want to achieve, is to not just rely on failures. We want to to find ways to, 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 to find the errors that doesn't result in failures, okay? So, so testing will not be just executing the application. It will actually be exercising the application. So think of this, you guys well, in the winter, you feel, well, not good. You feel, well, you're not ill, but it's like uncomfortable. Okay, but there is no failure yet. Okay, but you can, you can go to the, to, the, to the hospital and they do a checkup, okay? But what do they do with the checkup? They don't have you, well, they don't observe you. What they do is that they, they start to, to, to run tests, listen to your heart, your lung function, all this and that. So it's something like that we will go for when it comes to testing. Not observing the system, we will start to probe and exercise the system to pinpoint the errors and the faults. Okay. In order to, to, to uh, succeed with this, there are some must-haves. If we want to find a fault, we must make sure that, and now we're talking about code, uh, we must make sure that we can reach it. That we can reach that little statement or whatever it is. Because, well, and you, now I know what's going on in here. What does he mean by reach? Of course we can reach the code. Uh-huh. But what we're talking about now is something much more complex. It's not just a single statement because it's also the state. Because one little statement may infect the program state not all, every time, it can be some time, you see? It can be just one out of a million different states where this statement actually alters the state in an erroneous way. The third one is, is propagation. Besides this infection, we must also have a way to, to propagate, to, to have this error that propagates surfaces so that we can observe it. So there are this ch these challenges. So, so what do we do? As I said before, we will not execute applications, we will exercise, okay? Exercise means that 
we want to be able to control what's being exercised. Because we want to guide, we want to control the execution to the spot where we have the code that we want to test. And we want to control the execution so that we come to that spot with a certain state to make sure that this is a safe spot. There is no fault, there is no error generated. And then there is this observability. If we want controllability, if we want to make sure that, that uh, we can produce errors, we can see that, that uh, uh, they, well, we can control so that we end up in a, in a cer at a certain spot with a certain state. We must, well, well what, how, how can we detect errors? How can we make sure that, that this error actually surfaces so, so that we can observe it from the outside? So, so uh, when it comes to, to, to testing, you can see, well, controllability and observability this sounds almost like uh, system qualities, quality requirements. So, as a matter of fact, you can make your source code easier to control and easier to observe. There is even a, a, a name for that, and that's testability. So from a system perspective, what contributes to testability, and these are from, from, from this guy, Winder here, uh, first, if you want to test the system, you must know what to test it for, the requirements. Testing a system without requirements or any type of specification is not just challenging, it's impossible. Then, as I said, you can make your systems more testable, the implementation. And you can actually build in features to make your systems more testable. So, from the other perspective, the testing perspective, well, we have to uh, think of uh, general things, actually. Uh, the uh, things we use to exercise the application, the test suite, uh, is that well organized? Is it uh, extensible so that you can easily add things, remove things, so on and so forth? What tooling are you using? Some tools will make your uh, testing uh, much easier compared to, for instance, a situation where you use no tools. And then the testing process, because the testing process will be something that is a complementary or uh, additional process that, that, that some people argue that it's, it's separated from the development pro uh, process, but I, I still think that no, it should be part of it. But, but it's very important to get it right. Okay, so, so we will have systems that are complex. We have systems that are complex, and the only thing we know is that, and you can actually prove this, that uh, for a system of some size, there is no way to prove that it's fault 
free. There is no way. So, in fact, testing is impossible if you want to remove all faults. You can't do that. So again, what we want to achieve is something that is good enough. Okay. As you might understand, given what I, I talked about during the introduction here, testing requires development resources. If you go out and check some, some industrial products, it's not uncommon to find products that has as much code concerned with testing a system as they have code concerned with the system. And besides the, the, the code, there are the development, the, the testing tools. Uh, um, if you have hardware, uh, hardware somewhere in your, your systems of systems, you might have simulators, emulators running. You may have mock-ups. Setting up this environment is, is very challenging. But uh, what we will focus on today and, and, and next week is, is, well, test scripts, testing the system using software and focus on the software uh, aspect of it. So testing requires development resources. And, and I will now show you some, some uh, uh, not so good uh, photos from my, 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 my uh, mobile phone here. But this is from a big search engine company. And, and uh, this is the, the architecture they use for their continuous integration. Uh, continuous integration is, is, a, is a development strategy where you have a, a main line where, where developers continuously checks in. So, so you have almost always the most recent uh, uh, well the most the most recent version of your software so to speak is, is available, deployable. However, what you can see here is that that's not something that is that, that is done uh, for a, a, a company like the big search engine company, they have uh, thousands of engineers uh, working in parallel. And, and they have a map reduce architecture. Everything at this big search engine company uh, is probably map reduced. But what they do here is that they do some dependency analysis uh, on their builds. Uh, they configure uh, and then they spread out so they build and test in parallel. And then when they have built and tested in parallel, they, they reduce the results down here, aggregate, store, retry, notify, because there will be faults identified by the tests and so on. So it has to, has to go back and forth. So, so a complex architecture that is, uh, in fact, similar to, to what we see for complex software systems, just to, to manage this, this continuous integration. Not just that. Now we're talking about scale. How many test cases are typically executed? How much do they exercise per day? Well. Here are some, 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 some graphs, and, and it's not very, well, important, but you can see that the numbers on the left-hand side are, are big. So, so what we're looking for is, is the yellowish graph, that one, and you can see where it ends up. Test cases per day, rough average, for this particular system here, 80 million test cases being exercised. Just to, to, to show you guys that, well, <laughs> that this, is, this, is on, this is not what we're used to. 
And these guys are not exceptional. Sorry? I don't, I don't say, I can't say what's normal. Uh, because uh, it there are so many, it depends, it depends, it depends. But, but um, so uh, what's important here is in the same way as we, when we talked about architecture, you know, when we decompose, well, testing integrity. Because when we talk about a system, you will develop one part, you will develop another part, you will develop some part, you will be responsible for putting the pieces back together, you will be responsible for the UI, you will be responsible for the performance. Okay, before we can branch out and start doing things in, in parallel, you guys must decide, agree upon how this should be done. Okay, so you must make sure that integrity is preserved for the testing, which means that all the parts are tested. In, for instance, if you test for, for defects functional in, in functionality, you have a similar approach. Because what if you just try it out casually in front of the TV in the afternoon, while you, you spend days preparing your test scripts, analyzing data flows, making sure to have complete coverage. Well, the only thing we can say that, that the quality of the system is at risk. So integrity here is important. And, and uh, how do, do uh, we software engineers guarantee things? Well, we describe processes. So uh, what I will show you now is, is this is an ISO standard. Uh, there is an organizational test process which is more concerned with like company level, uh, <coughs> quality assurance, uh, how do we test at this company? How does the organization execute uh, the test project? on the development projects. Um, this level here, the test management process, is on a project level. But what you will see is that on a project there will be several smaller separate testing projects. Like I said before, someone will be responsible for defect testing of functionality, someone will be responsible for testing the performance of the system, someone will be more responsible for the integration of the parts. So there will be different objectives and different levels or uh, uh, different test levels uh, in, in a product. So uh, the reason why we see this here, the test management process is, well, the test management process, there will be static tests and there will be dynamic tests for different, obje uh, different objectives like functionality or performance for, uh, at different levels. So just on this slide, well, no one is asking the question, so, so what is a static test process? What is a static test? You guys all agreed before that in order to test your system you had to exercise it, okay? I keep you on hold for that. What this will give us is an opportunity to, to define this hierarchy of different processes that will help us to get to this integrity in our testing activities. So, let's have a look at the test management processes. Here we have the different, uh, a, you can see here at the top that, okay, we have a, the organizational test process here. 
okay? And then we have a, I would say, I will call this a project-wide test management process. But you can see here that we have another test management process down here, here. And it, it's another one of these. But what you, what you talk about here is typically test management for if you have different objectives, say, how do we test for performance? How do we test usability? How do we test security? How do we test functionality or different types? How do we do uh, unit testing, defect testing of the smallest uh, uh, elements we have when we code? How do we uh, do integration testing or how do we do system testing? So, so combining these guys here different test management processes with dynamic test processes and static test processes, we will actually get a, a, a tree-like structure. Or some people, uh, well, sometimes maybe not a tree, but, but just to show you an, an, an example. We have the product-wide test management process here, okay? Then we have a separate test process for functionality. So, so this will be part of the planning. So when you plan testing, you have to, to, to look, look at your, your system and say, okay, what type of test objectives do we have in this testing project? Well, I, I, I'm not sure, I have never ever seen a test project that doesn't include functionality. You see? So, so all products, of course, tests the functionality in the system. But you can do it differently. You can do it in many different ways. I would say that, that the majority of products I've seen will not have a static test process for the functionality. I've seen it, but not in the most instances. Most instance the instances have just regular dynamic tests, what you guys think of, where you execute parts of the application to, to make sure that we get the functionality into the system. But then, there is not just to it, this to it. There is, there is much more. We have the different uh, test levels or test types. You can also call. So, so we also have integration level where you have, you have developed parts of your system that you have tested. Okay. Now you're going to put these tested parts back together and now you have to test this combination. That's the integration level. And on that level, you have to test also for functionality. So there will be connections between the test levels and the test objectives. You see? So you will have your test level here for uh, uh, different objectives. And some objectives cannot be tested on the lower, the lower levels where you just have the units, the smallest testable units. They must wait until you have integrated them back into a composite. So, so when you plan your project, you have to think about, okay, what I'm going to test for? What should I test the system for in terms of objectives? At which level should I test? Should it be on the unit, te unit level, the integration, the subsystem or system level? The end of the day, what sh should be the acceptance test? There are so many things that must be considered here. Just decomposing the test product in a way that you will uh, uh, achieve this integrity. So let's have a look at static test processes. That was uh, probably 
at least, well, my, my father always told me, try to learn something new every day, and I think that this will be the new thing for the day for most of you. Uh, so a static test process is about exercising the system without executing it. And I should say executing part of the system. Because uh, typically what you do here is that you do a review of some part. And uh, the interesting thing here is that, that since you can do the static uh, tests without having well, gone through all the activities, you can save a lot of time if you can identify a fault this early. You see, if you, if you identify a fault in a design and remove it, you don't have to spend time on implementing that faulty design, developing tests and executing the tests to detect the fault, go back, fix the design, fix the implementation, rerun the tests. You can see that if you can remove it here first, you don't have to do all the things to identify, well, to, to detect where it was, correct, rerun the test. So you can save time the earlier you detect your faults, the earlier, or detect the errors, the earlier you remove the faults, I should say. So, what is this uh, static tests then? Well, preparation, review, follow up. So, so at the core here is really, what is the review? Uh, uh, Non-execution based testing, there are some flavors to it. There are reviews, well some people call it inspections, some people call it walkthroughs. It depends a little bit upon what you are currently testing. If it's source code, if it's a design document, if it's a requirements document, well, you can't do everything with all types of artifacts. You have to uh, treat them a little bit uh, slightly different. But the big benefit from static testing is that you can do it early. And if we focus on reviews uh, and don't really care about if it's a walkthrough or an inspection, it's just an examination of your own work. And it can be done by you, but it's much better if someone else checks it. So, so very basic. But I'm, I'm surprised that, that uh, sometimes when, when uh, well, we make that mistake every day. For instance, we, we send in a document without reading it completely from beginning to end. So, for instance, if I, if I write a, a text in English, I know, I know because I've done that in for 30 years almost, that I know which types of mistakes I make. You agree with me that you, we, we typically make the same mistakes when we write English and when we code, when we design. We make the same mistakes. We are good at some things and we are not as good at other things. So, so from a personal perspective, we know what we're good at and what we're not good at. So, there is an opportunity here for you guys. If you just write down, and you have to be honest, I typically make these mistakes when I code, five or ten of them. Okay? Then you code. Take this out and you go through that list and check your source code to see if you have... 
Just putting that on paper means that you're aware of them. And if you're aware of them, you're less likely to make those mistakes. See? But a design review or a code review, there is the objective to find product defects before we have to execute, exercise the system dynamically. So this came up in 1976 when I was a kid <laughs> and some of you were not born. Uh, what's important here is that this is not a salary talk. <laughs> it's not about you, it's about the artifact. The objective here is to find problems, not to come up with solutions. But if this should work, it must be a structured process. We cannot have casual chats when we have our coffee or uh, something like that. It's, it should be, be something that is focused on this artifact on a review with the objectives. It's interesting. You should always go to literature and, and, and figure out, or try to figure out, well, what can we, what are the benefits here? And if you have a unit test, when you execute, when you run code on the smallest testable uh, elements, ele smallest testable units, you typically find two to four defects per hours of testing. Two to four. And now we're not just talking about running, executing tests, because we have the test design, we have the coding of the tests, we have everything there. So two to four per hour. Code reviews, six to 10 per hour invested. Hmm. More than double up. Okay, so it's worth it. Here are another perspective on things. Tests generate failures. A failure, what was that? It was an error that had propagated, surfaced. So you can have a fault that introduces an error, an illegal state. Two weeks later, you get the failure. OK? So when you execute a test, dynamic test, it can be that over here you have the infection. Over here you have the surface, where the, uh, where the failure surfaces. You are not where the fault is. You are somewhere else. You can be in a different component, in a different object. But if you do re reviews or, well, code inspection, you are there. You're looking at the code, so you are there, so you know where the fault is, so you reduce the time. There's a team, you have a review leader, you have produ producer is the one who produced the artifact you currently review, like the code, the class, or whatever it is. Someone taking notes, and then you have a, guy, a bunch of reviewers. The result is a decision for the product. Is it okay? Should it be reworked? Or should it be just fixed? It's okay if you fix this. Then all participants sign off and say, okay, we agree to this. Agree to this. Here are some details about conducting a review. Raise issues. Don't try to resolve them. This is about finding, identifying faults. Some people have this just ask questions. You are only, as a reviewer, you're only allowed to ask questions to avoid this because it's very difficult to, to insert a solution to a problem in a question. Here are some examples of checklists, uh, but we'll talk more about them after the break. So 10 minutes from now, see you then. Okay, so uh, uh, 
welcome back. Uh, I got a question that I that I missed. You know, there are four screens here, and all well, many strange things going on here. So, so I got a question. Uh, where is testing important, and where is it not so important? Uh, there are uh, there are complete well. Uh, fields of study when it comes to safety critical systems. Safety critical systems, you can hear it, well, safety is critical. So, so car, aircraft, safety is, well, thank you someone, critical. Yeah. And, and uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you try to come up with there is, because remember now when I, what I said before that you can even actually prove that uh, you can't get all or find all the faults in your software or in your system. But what you can what you can achieve is some kind of good enough, uh, good enough safety. So so what you do there is that in in those domains. Well, of course testing will be extremely important. But testing is just one part of the game. Because what you work with there is something called assurances. So, or safety cases, where you have structures where you argue that this will be safe enough. And one thing is that, okay, we have software here, and this software has been tested, blah, 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 with all these techniques for these objectives and so on. And that's an argument. But, but if you think of a car, for instance, uh, uh, well, one of the safety measures to reduce, to increase safety, to reduce the, the risk of a mishap where we have fatal injury. Sorry, I'm using the terminology now of a different field, but the airbag is one example. Okay? Belt is another one. So it's not just about software. It's, it's, it's a combined thing where, when you talk about systems engineering. Uh, if we talk about software, of course, in those areas where we have systems of systems, where we have software controlling, um, well, a machine. So, so for instance, I'm working with a robotics company. Safety is critical there. Uh, some robotics companies allows for, for human, tight human interaction, because these robot arms can actually detect if a human is nearby. So if, but think of an industrial robot, a ton or two, moving, well, if it hits you, yeah, you're gone. So, so, so what they have there is like safety, 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 safety in software, safety in hardware. But testing there is, of course, extremely important. When it comes to, to, to other domains, well, for a bank, of course, testing is important. If you, if you think of an, an, an online, well, an e-store, testing is important. But I would say that it's on a, on a, it's a different type of importance. But at some point, of course, you come into a domain where the testing is not critical, or I should say less critical. Because if we talk about functionality, OK, I can accept that, uh, well, PowerPoint that I use frequently, if it crashes, and it does. Uh, every 50 time I use it, okay. I will get upset, but it's okay. So, so I'm not willing to pay the price for uh, the company to invest so much in testing. So testing costs money, and of course there is this balance. Are we willing to pay the price? I would say when it comes to safety criticality, yes. But when it comes to a tic-tac-toe app for your cell phone, no. I hope that uh, answers the question. So uh, let's continue. So here's, an, here's a checklist. And this is similar to the little notebook 
note that I ask you guys to, to think of uh, during the, uh, before the break. Is it clear where each requirement is going to be implemented using this architecture? Top level, first level decomposition, have we allocated responsibilities to our architecture to match the functional requirements to, or to match the requirements of the application? Okay, let's go through this. There are more. Does the structure of the system represent more functionality than specified by requirements? You remember one of the first lectures when we talked about minimum viable product? Don't do too much because if you start adding extras, you will just make your own life more complicated. So what you can do here is like prune your design. Do we need this method? What does this method, or is it just an extra that someone, this uh, implementer or designer, came up with because he or she thought that this is what I think should be in there? So. For the interfaces, do you have any unnecessary coupling? There are numbers, number, well, great numbers of questions that you can ask yourself when it comes to design. And, well, you can start it for, your, for yourself just with the code. It's called a personal software process. There's, uh, you can buy a book about it. How to collect qualitative, or well, your performance data from your, your, your coding and design activities and, and use that as your own personal improvement pro, pro, uh, program to, to become a better programmer. I took that class. <laughs> and, well, I learned a lot, but it's, uh, you don't see it uh, immediately. So now we come to the, well, we leave the static testing. And we, come back to the dynamic test so, so that you guys feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but I think you will learn something uh, also uh, on this side. So, okay, testing, ex exercising the application. Well, think of this integrity. We want, and also the controllability and the observability. So, your tests must be very carefully designed so that you control how you exercise the application to get to that spot with that state to make sure that that state, that spot, that combination is no error. There is no fault. So, uh, test design and implementation. Well, from there, you will get a parallel track because there will be a test environment. Think of the integration tests. Well, where you start put pieces together, possibly some little part of the system that should communicate with the database, for instance. Okay, you must make sure that the environment in which your system under test, SUT, will execute. It will not be the system you're testing. It will not be the system that eventually will be deployed, installed, and executed by the end users. No, you will test test systems. Systems that are designed and include code that will help you to control that, how you exercise and observe the state. But here you execute the tests and now what you know is that for this little state, this little spot of the source code, if I execute this statement, the system should be in this state. Now you have a system that you can observe. So you can actually dig out the results. 
and you can compare if the results of the, well, the actual state, if that was the expected state, and if it was, everything is fine. If it's not, you have some incident, you have some deviation from what they expected. So it means that, hmm, someone should have a look at this because this can be an error and a fault. Okay? So, when we talk about dynamic test processes, dynamic tests, well, what is a test? Well, this is a test object. And a test object can be a method. A method in one of your objects. It can be an object. It can be several objects linked together, collaborating. It can be several subsystems that interacts, communicates, work together to achieve some higher level functionality. It can be the final system, the complete system, maybe in a, a, an alpha or beta mode. You know, you can sign up for these beta testing programs where companies uh, test in the wild. They deploy a product that they know includes, uh, well, will have, where they, well, will get failures. And then they ask you guys that are eager to play the most recent version of a game or something, test out, test some, some operating system. Well, a test object can be anything from a method all the way up to a complete system. But the principle is that we test something with state and we test some behavior. Okay, there's more to it. Because when we exercise the test object, we feed it with some test data. Because we want to control that we end up, and here's the curve, at the right spot where we want to test, and that we test the correct behavior, or test the right behavior so that for correctness. So test data. So now we have full control over the execution, and it means that since we know the specification, we can determine determine the expected output, the test result. And we can say that if we feed the system with this data, the expected result is this. However, there's more to it. This red frame here describes the environment. Because you know that, that we cannot test something in, in isolation. There are always dependencies. Say that you're testing for performance. If you have five other applications running on your computer, that will affect the performance. So there is an environment that affects the, the, the test. So you have to take that into your test description. Then you have the analysis. Compare the expected result with the actual result to determine if you, if you have a devi deviation there, that's a failure, which indicates an error that could be a fault, OK? So this is a test, a controlled experiment, like when you get to the hospital they stick your finger, take some blood, analyze it, look at the actual result. Do we have a deviation from the expected? Hmm, we have a problem. Okay. But here we have a test. This is a test case, one instance. Remember, how many tests did the big 
search engine company exercise every day? Was it 80 million something of these? For different objectives, for di different types. Some testing for success, other tests are for testing failures. So, what I want to show you here is just that, okay, we have some test cases for our first test objective, which is functionality. We will have some for the performance objective and some for the security. And there is only one thing you can say about this picture, and that is that the number of test cases are just way too low. We're talking about hundreds of test cases. But then we also have the fact that, that we're testing at different levels. So there will be the unit level where we will have test cases, test, te testing well the method or the, the, the object or the class or whatever you use as our units. Then there will be on the integration level, you know, when we put objects together or subsystems together, having them collaborating, checking the functionality, testing for performance, testing for whatever we can test at that level. And then when we have the complete system, we can exercise the complete system in a controlled way to see if we can find if we can find uh, generate failures, deviations that indicate errors so that we can remove faults. So all these test cases make up different test suites or one test suite depending upon the size of the a collection of test cases for testing a software system. And, and what you can see is, is there are different ways of organizing your test cases. Some companies they have for different objectives of course, for different levels, for the same objective for different levels. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, but what's important is that, that it's not just the test cases, it's also about setting up the, the environment. So, now we're planning again. You have to identify not just your, our objectives and, and your level, you have to identify what are we going to test? Are we going to test all the methods? Are we going to test the objects? What are the units, the smallest testable units that we're going to exercise? What are we going to test them for? Are we going to test our methods for performance? Are we going to test our methods for security? Or are we going to test our methods just for the functionality that they meet their specification? Well, I would say that if you have methods as your unit, most organizations will say, okay, we have defect testing. That is, we're testing for deviations, defects, deviations in the implementation from the specification. So now we have the objectives and we have the objects. What, why, now we have how. How can we test? How can we test units? How can we design and implement our tests? How can we set up the environment? How can we execute the tests? How can we compare test techniques? That's something we'll spend more time on, 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 uh, on the lecture Tuesday. Here's a test suite. And how do we work with these test suites then? Well, when you work as a tester, the one thing you know, and that is that you will develop test scripts that 
describes the test cases and these test cases must be implemented and of course this is tedious work this is something that is repetitive uh, several tests well all the test cases have the same structure uh, which is more or less set up uh, exercise uh, check if expected and, and, and actual result and do something about it okay so there well people of course have worked out ways of, of automating these uh, uh, repetitive tasks and 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 a testing framework is something that in the same way as any other framework something that can help us in in, in uh, 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 setting up and maintaining our, our test suites so so this is a, a testing framework called X unit so so there are several implementa different implementations of, of this testing framework. Uh, it will provide us with the structures necessary to implement a test suite. And it will help us with the execution part a lot because there are ways, you know, 80 million test cases every day. Just think of a non-automated process where we have people executing 80 million tests every day comparing the actual with the expected well how much time will we invest every day how much time will we lose so automation using these test drivers is a must Uh, XUnit provides, well, a, a, a conceptual model with, uh, where you use something called assertions, that you assert that the value should be this. That is, means that you can check if the actual result matches the expected. Uh, when you run these tests, there will be well, similar or the same test environment that must be, well, available for different test suites. So, so uh, what they provide then is something called test fixtures that, that can be set up. You exercise your, your system and you tear down the, 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 the fixture. And it also provides for, for different types of test runners. And, and uh, if you're in the Java world or C Sharp world, there are these uh, uh, JUnit, for instance, which is an implementation of XUnit. Uh, there are also examples for, for many other languages, including JavaScript. So, so XUnit works with a, a four phase testing uh, pattern. A four phase. Well, it means that we have a setup, we have an exercise, and we have a verify, and we have a teardown phase. So, a simplified view on things uh, is something like this you have a test runner that instantiates a test case. Okay, so we create a t an object for the test case, okay? In this test case, there will be a description uh, of a test method, okay? Which includes a setup, an exercise, a verify, and a teardown part. And, and when we invoke the test here, the... Uh, test case sets up the system, system under test. As I said, well, on the previous slide, I said that, well, this a lot, well, they allow us to share uh, the environment. So, so you can have a system, you don't have to set up this uh, system under test every time. You can, you can set it up once and you can exercise uh, several uh, 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 tests 
on the same system. But you set up, next is exercise. After you have exercise, you have an actual result, okay? What do you do? You verify. Okay. And now I could have a nice animation to remove all the uh, boxes on this side, which would be the teardown. Okay? I don't. But think of a, a setup. Say that you have a, a linked structure of objects, a linked list. Just a very simple example. You know that uh, if you want to add an object to this list, the, object, the list can be in any of three states. So if you want to exercise all important states to make sure that the add another object to this linked structure, you have to think about first the empty list. Okay, that's an important state. So you need to set up the linked list so that it's empty. Okay. Then you exercise the add method. So what is the expected result if you add an object to an empty linked structure? The object is in the list. Okay. Next. Second state that is important is that, well, we have a list with, well, depending upon the implementation, as we will see uh, next week, the implementation is important here. But typically, if we add elements at the tail of the list or at the head, well, we test for different things. But typically, we want to test a list with just one object. What happens? Well. If we have a specification that says adding an element, we add it to the tail, we exercise a list with one object, adding another object, the expected result should be the list with the most recently added object at the tail. Then we can exercise it again with two objects, but then it starts to become unnecessary because we're talking about computers, we're talking about computer programs. So, so if you have 3, 4, 6, 12, 90, 100, doesn't really matter, does it? No. We just want to test the logic in that add method. But now we want to rerun the test. We have added, say, two objects. Well. If we want to rerun, because, well, to just to, we made some changes. We want to rerun this test suite of this, uh, where we add objects to this structure. Well, we cannot have this structure around. We have to set up the system again. Empty, one object, two objects. So that's why we have this set up and tear down. I, I will never remember the first time I had a group of students that, they were so frustrated. Well, what, what's the problem? Well, you know, we have this database. Every time we run this test, we add data to the database. Yeah? So what's the problem? Well, every time we have to, we've done the test or run the test, we have to, to clean the database. We have to set up the tables, all the, everything must be... So, if you have these setups and teardowns, those are like the, the tedious routines for populating the data with the data you need, the state you need for exercising your test, and then you tear it down, you remove, you reset, call it whatever you want, so that you're back in a state so someone, some other test can be, be, be exercised. Okay, so XUnit, I would say that, maybe people will jump at me now, but it was de developed for unit tests, but you can still use it for 
integration tests and so on. But uh, that's it. But it's a very powerful, and I, all these testing frameworks, they are like uh, a game changer. They make life so much easier for us. It's just a little tedious in the beginning when you have to get over the, the sometimes steep learning curve to figure out how they work. But, but they, are, they are, well, extremely important because they are like taking care of, of uh, managing test cases, running the test cases, uh, help us with, with the verification, all this and that. And another thing, they are uniform. So in the next project you're in, it's the same framework. If you have done it yourself over and over again, all the, for each and every project, you will spend days, months, years just to get the test code in place. So the principle for X unit test classes, having test objects, so you have like a separate type for, for your tests. Uh, there are fixtures for what's called sequencing in some literature, setting up the state, resetting the state after some test case, or resetting it after all tests in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a suite of tests. You can check out jjunit.org here for, for more information. So, at a pedagogics course, they told us to say the same things twice, at least, in different ways. So let's do it with a picture. You have a test fixture, fixture here at the bottom. The test fix, fixture is, is, well, more or less the state you want the system in. And it can also be helper functions and so on. But it, it's like, in principle, it's like setting up the system so that it's in a state that where you can exercise your your, your, your uh, test methods, okay? Then we have some yay unit, or sorry, some unit tests uh, for a class or for, for an object. And, and, well, what you have there are a number of test cases, typically for a method, or you will have several test cases for the same method, as we say, saw with the, the add uh, example for, for the linked structure. Okay, but there's more to it. There are more unit tests, there are even more unit tests, and this makes up your test suite, okay? And then we have, with this architecture, because there are lots of interfaces, lots of classes that we specialize, we can actually have a, a generic test runner that we feed the test suite to, and the guy will help us with the ex uh, execution, uh, report back if it finds any deviations, uh, where the deviation was. Very nice little thing to help us uh, reducing our effort. So unit tests, test the methods, exercise the methods in a class or in an object. A test case tests typically a single method in, in, in an object here. Each method must be tested several times, different aspects, different states. We have test suites combining different test cases and then the fixtures for setting up or resetting the state. And this can be between different tests or before and after the complete te uh, test suite is invoked. As I said uh, before, the XUnit architecture also provides us with uh, help in terms of, of writing the what's expected and so on. And that will help us because we don't have to write up all these if statements. If result equals expected result, then we get it for free. So what we've been struggling with now is, is, is actually the, the, 
the mechanics here. Setting up the test environment, how to reduce our effort for, for uh, uh, writing up the test code, uh, executing the test code, reporting back, performing the verifications, all this and that. Uh, but you can do more things. Uh, you can, for instance, in work with the, the testability of your code. And, and uh, the typical uh, uh, approach for testing is that you, you write your, your, your ob test object, well, if it's a class or, or, or something, user-defined type, you, you write that test for the class, and that includes all the methods, everything. But, well, together with the, the agile movement, well, people have started to work with, with a more test-driven development. I'm not sure if you remember the uh, extreme programming uh, graph for that process where they had like write the test cases very early. You, and, and this is like test-driven development. You, the, you, you, because what is a test? We have a requirement specification, which is translated into some design specification, which is implemented in some programming language, which is in fact another specification. And then we write the test. What they suggest is that well, if you spend time on, on implementing, developing something, it's worth testing. So, so the test is actually a design specification. Because you test that if the system is in this state and I exercise this method with this, these parameters, this is the expected result. So this is a design specification. So, so, so what they, what they say here is that you write the test before you code. You write the test as a specification for your code. That means that you focus on how, not how it should be implemented when you're a designer. But using these pre and post conditions, we talked about that when we briefly went through the, the use case descriptions. You know, a condition that holds before you start doing something and a condition that holds after you completed something, pre and post. Well, together with the method signature, you actually have a way to specify uh, expected results with the pre and the post condition. If you are in this state, a precondition, you invoke a method with these parameters, the system should be in this state, post-condition. But when you hear the word or the acronym TDD, test-driven development, most people think about testing. But in fact, it's about design. But it's a very nice little idea to have to write your tests early. And as I said before, this comes from, from, from the, this test first development. One of the fun fundamental principles in, 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 uh, in agile uh, development, uh, engineering practices uh, that, that uh, you see in, in extreme programming, for instance, uh, you can combine this into to, to what you've seen uh, for dynamic tests. You can do that. Uh, but they don't want to do it like that because uh, they don't think it's that agile. But in principle, what you do is that you, you have, you, you come in up here, you have an a initial state here with some kind of a, a specification for some behavior. A requirement specification, you add a test, you write a test for that behavior, uh, 
then you run your test. What? Where's the code? No, you, you, well, the principle here is, is test first. So having nothing, exaggerating a bit here, but, but having nothing, you run the tests. And of course, the, system, the, the test will fail. So then you start making changes to your code. You run your tests again, and you do this. until you pass. And if you pass, you can oh, go up here and continue. And now, you add another test. And might that can actually be the case, and well, I, I don't, I'm, hope I don't have to convince you that when you add a new test, you run the test, it can actually pass without you making changes to the code. Think of this adding to a link structure. If it's empty, that's the first test. OK, it fails. So you add some code. If there is one object, depending upon your implementation, if you can find a tail, of the current list and, well, add something to, 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 to the reference of that tail object to its, its, its uh, next object and, well, you can actually make it work immediately. But in principle, you should not add that uh, because you don't have to add that for, for passing the first test. But then, when you've done it for so you have like two objects in the structure, then if you try it with three or 15, well, it will go through. So principle, add a test, exercise. If it passes, fine. If it fails, make some changes, and then run the tests again and repeat until successful. And as I said, this can be leveled up to acceptance TDD, for instance, which is what they think of something called behavior-driven development, where you, you create hierarchies of these, where you have behavioral specifications. So you actually branch out. When you make the changes, you can have several of these TDDs or test-first developments in, 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 in parallel going on don't want to make life too complicated for you. But what happens here is that, that we will m work with, in a slightly different way, we will start working with like micro evolutions. So there will be small changes, tests, small changes, tests, small changes, tests, all the time. And, and some people say that, hey, shouldn't you start thinking about your design? What if you are making all these small changes all the time? There is a great risk of, of architectural erosion and drift, or design drift, or whatever they call it, that you have a end up with a design that at some point is so fragile that it will crack if you just add something to it. Well, what you do is that besides these small changes, there is also room for refactoring. So, so you do changes also to the structure of your system, not just adding more and more and more behavior. So you can do uh, refactorings. Well, if, you, if you're using a, a modern IDE, you could just search for refactorings, and you would find a list that change name is the simple ones. You can, you can do pull-ups and, and push-downs, where you move uh, behavior up and down in the, in the inheritance hierarchy, or whatever you want, it, in the prototype chain, and so on. So you have to think more about, well, uh, the structure of the system, if you work like this, because it's more like inside out instead of uh, what I've been uh, arguing for outside in. So, oops, that was. OK, so now we come to, to the environment. I've been briefly mentioning this, but the environment. Mm -hmm. Remember that, that we have the, the guys, uh, the test objects, situated in an environment. So. Uh, 
The problem with the objects at the edge of the system, that is like not part of the test objects, but part of the environment, they are not that controllable or observable. So, so sometimes you, you have to, well, play a little game creating mock objects. Think about a credit card company. It's difficult for us to, to, to give MasterCard a call and ask if we can use their service just when we test, their, uh, test our system. They would probably say no. But uh, what we can do is that we can look at their interface and we can, we can create something that behaves like that service. So, look at this service. What type of behaviors may we accept, uh, expect? And now we test the code that depends upon this service. So, so something like this. We have test data for the test object. We have state. We have result. And we have this environment. And now, this happens. This external thingy, this service, situated somewhere in the world, somewhere where we don't have no, we have no control, we cannot observe it. Well, it's suddenly part of our environment. So what we have to do now is we have to make sure that we can control and observe also this little guy. So what do we do? We create a mockup. So, this is uh, a class structure for, for uh, well, the credit card payment, the credit card issuer. And we, we think that, okay, these, this thing goes up here because validate credit card is not something that we can do. It must be done up here. Okay. So, so how can we do that if we can't control... Uh, the company that, that issued the, the, the credit card. I gave you the answer. We create, we fake, we emulate the behavior of, of uh, the credit card issuer. So, so what we're doing now is that we're creating a parallel structure. You see? We have something here that we is part of the design for our final system, okay? But when we test the system, we will use this one until we have reached a state where our application is so that, well, we're allowed to connect to and, and actually exercise with the real system at the other end. So this is an example of, well, adding more to the system development project. Have to think about a parallel structure. How can you test a system if parts of the system are not implemented? That's another example where you need this. Okay, so last slide. Today's takeaways. Testing is a challenge. Indeed it is. And think of planning, design, implementation, execution of, well, different, for different objectives, for different levels, different types of systems. There can be legal uh, restrictions, regulations, controlling what type of tests you must perform, must, must execute. The fact that you have a test object in the middle that can be anything from a method to a complete system. And now that was the takeaway of the day, the static testing, that you can actually test your system just by reading. And you can do it yourself. And you can learn from it and you can improve. Next week, Tuesday, I will spend the full lecture for, for, uh, on different techniques, 
how do you well design your tests how do you uh, design the implement or implement your tests and how can you exercise and, 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 and uh, verify the results. So we will focus on two techniques, one for unit tests and one for integration tests, which is more related to API testing. So I see you guys next week. Bye for now.